You know, as I was studying for this sermon this week, you know, a lot of things have been happening. You know, we've been studying the fruits of the Spirit. And we all know that a fruit is something that has to be grown. It's not something that's given. And tonight, last week, I talked about faithfulness. You know, and, and uh, as I was reviewing the, the message from last week, moving into this week, you know, I talked about Moses last week and how one simple act that he did caused him not to be able to go into the promised land. Yes. Instead of speaking to the stone, he struck it, which caused him to forfeit his right to walk into the promised land. And that can happen to every one of us. That's right. But the Lord met, you know, showed me something this week. He says, you know, there's a difference between a stumble, yeah. which many of us do, and willful disobedience. Yeah. And that's what Moses did. When Moses struck that rock, it wasn't a stumble, it wasn't a fall. It was willful disobedience. And what I want to talk to you tonight is about long-suffering. Because, you know, our God suffers long with us. Amen. And one of the key factors in having love for one another is to be able to have that long-suffering. You know, long-suffering is nothing more than patience, endurance. We have to be able to endure the walk that we are called to walk. You know, I was sitting in my office, and I'm, I'm sitting there writing these notes, and, you know, I'm struggling with this because, you know, sometimes I am not the most patient individual, as my sister found out this afternoon when she called me four times. Uh, <laughs> I kind of got a little sharp with her. But as I was sitting there, you know, I, I'm looking at the way my life is going, you know. Basically, I eat, sleep, work, and preach. And I'm looking at this and I'm going, Lord, there's got to be something more. You know, come on, if I'm not trapped in my office at work, I'm trapped in my office at home. And the Lord says, you know what? What are you seeking? What is it that we're seeking tonight? What, are, what, what is it that defines who we are? What is it that makes us who we are? And the Lord says, you know, sometimes it's that battle that you face every day that defines the person that you are. Yes, amen. You know, I've been through a lot of struggles in my life. I have not always been a model Christian. If you know my testimony, you know that I walked astray for a long, long, long time. And I paid the consequences of such. And in that time, the Lord was very long-suffering with me. He kept me under His wing. There's many times I shouldn't have walked away from the situation I was in. I should have been dead. But God knows. He had a plan. He had a purpose. Even though I didn't see it. When I told you before, you know, if you would have told me five, six, seven years ago that I would be up here preaching tonight out of laugh. I'd have laughed so hard I'd have been on the ground rolling around. Because, you know, I knew the lifestyle I was living. And God was very, very enduring with me. But it's that struggle I want to talk to you tonight about. It's that one thing that no matter how we face it, you know, even if we lose the battle, it still defines our character. Yes. You know, there are many things that we fight. As, as Christians, you know, the, the Bible goes through a whole lot of different things that we, we, we go through. You know, we fight a battle. And it's not necessarily a flesh and blood. It's against powers and principalities, as the Word says. Sometimes we fight family members. Sometimes, you know, we fight a battle with family members. Whether it's not we're arguing with them, but there's something going on in their lives that we're struggling with. Sometimes it's work-related. You know, there's a lot of times at work that I feel so frustrated, I just want to go outside and just scream until my ears pop off. 
And I know Mike feels the same way sometimes. <laughs> you know, we work in similar types of fields and in similar types of environments. Shops are not more most conducive to a Christian walk. Sometimes we just get so frustrated. You know, being in a supervisor role, I deal with a lot of people. And sometimes these people just make me want to reach out and give them a touch. And not necessarily in the best way. <laughs> so we struggle. We struggle with, with internal problems. And like I said, you know, Moses' problem wasn't that he stumbled and fell. It's because he willfully disobeyed what the Lord said. But there's times that we stumble and we fall. And we get up and we pick ourselves up and we say, Lord, I'm tired. I I'm worn. I'm weary. I'm beat up. I'm abused. And I just want you to forgive me. I just want your love that we were talking about this morning. That reason that he hung there on that cross with his arms open wide. And I heard a song tonight, his arms were open so wide, it was a proof of his love because you can't get any more than this. How much do you love me? I love you this. And to this day, he's already paid the price for our sins, and to this day, he's still paying. He still loves us, even though he paid the price. He never stopped loving us. He never stopped giving to us, even when we don't want it. You know, Paul puts it pretty precise in Romans. And, you know, me and the pastor were talking about going back to those familiar verses all the time, but there's no way I could avoid it, this verse. It says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We got peace. We got acceptance. It's through those battles. <coughs> Excuse me, I've been fighting sinus and colds. It says, through him we also have access by faith into grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we glory in afflictions also. There's that struggle that we're talking about. The reason why we have to have that long suffering. The problem with these fruits of the Spirit is the fact that they don't come to us fully mature. We have to grow them. The things that we're talking about here, love, joy, peace, long suffering, meekness, goodness, kindness, these things don't happen overnight. These things take time to grow. The problem with most Christians is they say, Lord, give me grace, give me peace, give me long-suffering, and they expect it to happen overnight, and the minute that doesn't happen, they give up. If you want long-suffering, suffer long. <laughs> expect the trials and tribulations that are coming so that you can develop that long-suffering, that patience with your spouse, with your children with the people that you work with, with the people out on the street that you don't even know who are giving you a hard time, the drivers out here on 10 Mile and Mount. <laughs> yeah, roll your eyes. That drive can be hazardous on some days. And the more ice and the more snow you get, the more hazardous it gets. The more stupid it gets. <laughs> yeah, some people don't do stupid well. <laughs> but you know that patience that we're supposed to develop with, with, with our fellow man you know the, the one thing I know about the fruits of the spirit it's all about character it's our character that, that Paul's trying to develop and not only our character but these are ministry tools you know I was listening to Charles Stanley this morning as because I hadn't been able to sleep in a couple of days, so I'm sitting up, and, and I'm having a cup of coffee, and I'm watching Charles Stanley before the wife gets home. And he says, you know, the problem, he was talking about the three types of men, the carnal man, the, the natural man, and the spiritual man. And as he talks about the carnal man, he says, you know, this is the thing. The problem with the carnal man is he's got a limited diet. He can only have milk. Second thing is, is he's not growing. He doesn't grow up. And the third thing is, he doesn't have a ministry. And, by, and most of us that are sitting in the pews, by now, 
If we'd been in church for any period of time, she'd have our own ministry of some sort or another. The problem is, we just want to sit and be hand-fed for our entire walk with Christ. We'd rather have the preacher come up there with a spoon of the gospel and feed it to us rather than search it out for ourselves. But God's calling us today. He says, here, these are the tools I'm going to give you that are going to give you the, the ability to have your ministry. And one of them is long-suffering. And you know, as I've been around the churches for most of my life, even though I never, you know, there was a period of time I wouldn't set foot in one. And when I did, they started looking down their nose at me and say, you a sinner. I walked out. I got tired of the attitude. People looking down their nose at me isn't a very Christian attitude. But, you know, as, as, as I looked around, I'm finding more and more that Christians just do not have that patience God is calling them to have. That's right. yep. He's not, we don't have that love that He is calling us to have. If you look at a lot of churches and, and you look at the people that go there, they're starting to resemble more and more the pharisaical attitude than they are the discipleship attitude that we're supposed to have. And what I mean by pharisaical is they look good on the outside. They've got that nice $200, $300, $400 suit on and they, they, they talk the talk and they walk the walk. But when it comes right down to it, they don't have the love that Christ called us to have. And I'm, I'm going to get back to them in a minute because there, there's something that God tells us to do about that. But he says this, knowing that afflictions work out patience. If you don't go through anything, you're never going to endure long. If you don't go through anything, you will never grow. If you don't go through anything, then you're not doing anything. I'm telling you right now, if you're having the best time of your life, I guarantee you that something's wrong in your life. You know, God gives us a brief respite, but He never promised us peace in this world. He promised us peace to make it through this world. And if, if people aren't getting on us about our walk, ain't getting on us about our talk, if, if we're not going through some struggle somewhere, somehow, we're not growing and we ain't going because we ain't living. We're going with the flow. And patience works out experience. And experience works out hope. And that's one of the biggest things that we have today is the hope that one day he's coming back and I'm going home. Yes, amen. That's our hope. Our hope isn't in salvation because we know we have that. We know that Christ died for our sins. He hung on that cross for us, so we're not hoping in our salvation. If we're still hoping in our salvation, we need to be at the altar. We're hoping that what the Bible says is true and that one day he's coming home and I'm going home. That's our hope. I hope that I can live the life that he wants me to live with the tools that he's given me to, get, to, to live with. I hope that I can be a better person each and every day that I'm on this earth. Through his strength and his glory, not mine. Because if I'm counting on my strength and my glory, I ain't going nowhere. We were talking about thermostats tonight. If I'm depending on my own strength and my own glory, I'm going where the thermostat never needs to be turned up. In fact, we might want to, you know, invest in an air conditioner. Because it's awful hot. And hope does not make a shame because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us. So if we got patience, 
God's love is being poured into our hearts. And we were talking about God's love this morning. See, that's what I like about the pastor and me. You know, we don't, all, we don't ever know what we're going to preach, what the other one is going to preach. But we usually work in sync. That tells me God's working. You know, I thought he was preaching something totally different this morning. I had the notes all printed up and he spoke out love. He changed up on me in midweek. Didn't tell me. <laughs> but you know, God had a plan and a purpose. Because he knew what I was going to preach on. He puts the two in order. You cannot have love without patience. And you can't be patient without love. If you love somebody, you will be patient with them. To a point. At some point in time, you may want to strangle them, but you will still be patient with them. <laughs> Ten kids, <laughs> you were patient. <laughs> they all lived to see their third. <laughs> and I call you a saint because I had five, and that was more than enough for me sometimes. <laughs> But, you know, as, as we develop patience, our love grows. <laughs> but we can't have love without that patience. You know, it's a paradox. God gave, gives us a little bit of love, and we still have to grow that. We automatically come into this world, and the first person we see is our mother. We're laid upon her bosom, and we love her automatically. So we know what love is. And she loves us in most cases. But, you know, in today's world, that is becoming rare. In today's world, love is not found even between mother and child. See, this is the thing for we yet being without strength in due time, Christ died for the young God. When I was, when I didn't even want Him, you know, I was rolling around in that bar, in that gutter, having a good old time like the prodigal son, loving every minute of it. I didn't want God. I wanted to revel in my sin, and He still loved me regardless of what I was doing. That's what it means when it says He loved the ungodly. This world did not want a Savior. The Roman citizens did not want a Savior. And I'm going to tell you something, the Jews didn't want a Savior either. They were quite content with what they had. The religious order, they were sitting there and they were raking in the dough, selling all these sacrifices, and the people were none the wiser, but they wanted Jehovah. They didn't want a Savior. They didn't know what a Savior was. And yet, even though He wasn't wanted, we didn't know we were sick. And He shows up at the door. And He says, I'm the physician. I'm here to heal all your ills. And when He came aboard, men knew that there was sickness in the world. You know, the most, you know, I was thinking about this as I was, as I was studying. You know, when I read the Word, especially in the New Testament, Christ and God spent more time criticizing the religious community than they did the sinners. When James says, he who has no, or John, 1 John 1 a, he says, he who has no, who claims to have no sin, he lies. He's talking to Christians. When James is talking about disorder in the church, he's talking about Christians. You know, there are so many things in the Word that, that you'd say, well, you know, isn't that based towards the sinner? No, it is based towards the Christians because sometimes we get an attitude and we say we are, we get to be condescending, we get that pharisaical attitude. 
And we start looking down on our brother and God says, that's not what I intended you to do. You're here to love, to help, and to minister, to bring the weak up when you're strong. And part of that is to endure. Now this, this second Peter, now I, I was only going to go one or two verses in it, but the Lord really wanted me to go through the whole chapter, and I may not make it through it all tonight, but I gave you the whole chapter. But I want you to understand something. When it comes to endurance, the apostles were champions of endurance, of long-suffering. When Peter wrote this epistle, and my personal belief is Peter wrote it, but there is some dispute as to the authorship. And I'm going to let you know that now. But when Peter wrote this epistle, he wrote it just before he was crucified. Peter was crucified. Just like his Savior. The only difference between Peter's crucifixion and Christ is he would not be hung the same way as Christ if they hung him upside down. Which is even worse. But here Peter is in, coming to the end of his life. And he's sitting in a prison cell and he's dictating this to some person who's writing this down. And he says this. He says, Beloved. He's looking at people and he's calling them dear friends. Beloved. Showing endearment to the church. I now write this second letter to you in which I stir up your pure minds by reminder. He says, to remember the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandments of the Lord and Savior by us, the apostles. He say, okay, here it is. I'm writing this here to make you, to remind you of what we had to say and what the prophets before us had to say. We're all in conjunction. We're all preaching the same thing. Much like me and the pastor, or the pastor and Mike. Or if you listen to some of those preachers, now I've never had much of a use for televangelists, tele but there are some good ones out there yet. I'm going to tell you right now, the days of the Billy Graham Crusades, the days of the Jimmy Swagger Crusades, the John Hagee Crusades are over. You don't see them out there like they used to be. And as a nation, we got so dependent on them to do our work for us that we forgot how to witness. We would depend on Billy Graham to come to town and he would save thousands. Jimmy Swagger and Kenneth Hagin and John Hagee and Kenneth Copeland would come into town and they would have this big convention and people would go there and get saved. Saved us the work. As like Christians, we didn't have to do anything. We just took them there. We didn't have to have a ministry. We got lazy as a church. But here he's saying that, you know, I'm going to bring to remembrance what we taught you. Before I die, I want you to remember this. First, knowing this, that there will come in the last days scoffers walking according to their own love. Okay. Okay. How many of you have actually seen that today? Now, how many of us are in agreement that we're in the last days? Regardless of the time when he shows up, we are in the last days. We've already seen all the signs come to pass. It's just a matter of when, not if. And saying... Where is the promise of His coming? How many people out there have said, you know what, I don't know about you, but you know, Christ has been predicted to come so many times that I don't believe He's coming at all. But yet, His promise is there. That is the hope that we were talking about earlier. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. 
Yeah, um, I think I think you know in that aspect, every lie has a little bit of truth. But see, they don't see the bigger picture. All they're looking at is okay. We go to work, we eat, we sleep, we go to work, we come home. It's all the same. It hasn't changed since the time that Adam was created to the time that we're living in now. It's all the same. So where is the promise? For this is hidden from them by their, by their willing it, that the heavens were of old and the earth out of water, and through water being held together by the word of God, through which the world was then being flooded by water perished. Well, it hasn't been the same since creation because, number one, we had a flood. And not just some minor flood over here on I-696 where we, you know, we lost a couple cars a couple years ago. We're talking a major flood. Scuba gear wasn't helping you. If you weren't on that ark, you weren't on that boat, you weren't going anywhere. But the present heavens and the earth being kept in store by the same word are being kept for fire until the day of judgment. Now I'm not much of an end time preacher. But I'm telling you right here, Peter is saying that this world is going to end in fire. We already, we already had one problem with water. Now, the Lord promised that He's going to burn this place. He's going to renew it. And one thing I'll tell you about a forest fire is that is the best thing that can happen to a forest. It may sound bad, but a forest fire is actually a renewal of life. As that, as that wood burns, as those trees burn off, it creates sediment in the ground which creates fertilizer and the seeds grow and they grow much better and they will grow much stronger than they did previously. Fire is good. But I don't think I want to get caught up in the fire that's coming. But it's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. and the destruction of the ungodly men. But beloved, let not this one thing be hidden from you. Now he's going to remind you what these guys have been talking about for a long time. That one day is with the Lord a thousand years. And a thousand years is that one day. We're talking about long suffering today. And, and I want you to see where I'm going with this. Because here we are, we got Peter, he, he's looking... At, at his life coming to an end and he's trying to remind you of certain things that those hopes, those promises that we are holding on to, we have to endure with. God says he's going to give us a promise. He's going to do something for us and we're not seeing it yet. We have to be we patient with God. If we're not patient with Him, then we're going to give up and walk away. And that promise He gave us is not going to be fulfilled. You know, He's promised us a lot of things in the Word. But you know, God doesn't just promise things in His Word. He gives us personal promises. You know, myself, He promised to take me out of the situations that I was in. And I've seen some of those situations resolve. And you know what? When the Lord's ready, the rest of it will go. God is not slack. 3.9 God is not slack regarding His promises as some count slowness. Different version. But His long-suffering towards us Not proposing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. You know, here's the thing. We need to be long-suffering with God. We have to be patient with God. We have to be patient with ourselves. Because, you know, if we're not patient with God, we're going to miss. We're going to give up on Him and we're going to walk away. 
If we're not patient with ourselves, we're going to give up on ourselves and walk away. Because we haven't come to that perfection yet. Like I said earlier, there's a difference between stumbling and falling. And some of us who are addicts who know the difference. Uh, we, me and the pastor were talking. As of today, I've been clean for four years. But I tell you what, I cannot walk into a bar by myself to this day. Because I know the minute I walk into that bar, I'm going to have one drink. And that one drink is going to lead to two, which is going to lead to a fifth, which is going to lead to a half gallon, and I'm going to get stupid. I'll never lose them cravings. That's why they call us recovering alcoholics and not cured alcoholics. We're not cured addicts. We're recovering addicts. Because those urges are always there. And we have to have patience and endurance to make it true because some of the trials and temptations that we're going to go through are going to push us right back into those situations where we're going to want to use again. Right. If we have temper issues, I know some of us do. we got to be patient because sometimes the situations that, we're, that are facing us will push us to such a point where our ears turn red, our face turns red, and we just want to let that tongue loose. And it kills us when we can't. I would just love to tell so-and-so what I feel about him right now. <laughs> but you know what? That would definitely go against the love that we're supposed to have that Pastor was talking about this morning. There are times, you know, like I said, my sister is going through some situations right now. She's got a spot, she's got some problems with her lungs. She's got COPD. She's not breathing right. They won't let her go back to work. They won't let her smoke. She's been five days without a cigarette. She's on steroids. She, she's trying to suffer through this, and she's blowing up my phone. I ain't slept in two days. I finally fell asleep this afternoon after I got home from church. And my phone starts to blow up. First time I looked at it, it says, decline. It's just my sister. I'll deal with her when I wake up. Now, 30 seconds later, it goes off again. Decline. I'm going back to sleep. 30 seconds later, answer. Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> God says we're not supposed to be that way. As pastors, we're not really supposed to answer the phone that way. And if it would have been anybody but my sister, I probably wouldn't have. But we take family for granted. Sometimes we get angrier with family than we do with outsiders. Because they should know better. So what I did is I, I hung up and I said, well, I ain't going back to sleep now. So I grabbed me a cup of coffee, and I went out there and had a cup of coffee, and I called my sister back. I says, what's up, sis? And she, she, wanted, she just wanted to feel loved. She was afraid. She's going through a lot of things. My mother was diagnosed with cancer at the very same age. My sister is right now, 47. And by the time she was 50, she had passed from lung cancer. So this is weighing on my sister's mind. She wanted to reassure her. But you know, sometimes God puts something in our path to get our attention. And that's what I told her tonight. I got on her and said, Joy, you got to remember something. Since you moved back to that hotel, you haven't set foot in church one time. You think God's trying to get you, get your attention a little bit here? God is not slack concerning his promises. He would have that none perish. He's just waiting for that last soul to say, yes, God, I will, and he's coming back. He's being patient for that last soul. Yes, amen. Amen. And so should we. 
Now, I'm not going to go any further into Peter because I'm going to end this real quick. But here's the thing. Not only do we have to be patient with God and patient with ourselves, but we have to be patient with our fellow man. Amen. Amen. God says, the only two commandments I expect you to truly follow is love God with all your heart and love your brother as yourself. If you follow those two commandments, all the others will fall into place. And if you love your brother, you will be patient, you will be kind. When Christ was sitting there with the adulteress, and they had cast her half naked or fully naked in front of him, and they accused her, he stooped down, started writing something in the sand. He says, he who has no sin cast the first stone. If God was that patient with us, Amen. he expects us to be that patient with our fellow man. Long-suffering is one of those things that we must have, that we must develop. Without it, it's like having no love. And Paul says, I, even though I speak with the tongues of angels and I have not love, it is like a tingling of symbols. Yeah. Though I prophesy, it is all for naught if I have not love. Amen. Amen. If we don't have that love for one another, if we don't have that love for our brothers, if we don't have that love for that person out there that we don't even know yet, we're wrong. That's right. We have to be patient with them. We have to be kind. We have to be gentle with them. We have to be kind with our brothers and sisters in this church. Or in any church. We even have to be kind to those pharisaical attitudes that we find in the church. That's why I said I'd come back to it. Because even though they're standing there going, yeah, is that Marlboro and Jack Daniels? You're a sinner. We still have to love Even though they're chasing people out of the church. Because the church is for the ill, not the well. We're a hospital for the sick of souls. Not a social club for those who want to sit here and play canasta. We're not here just to sit in a pew and soak up the word like the carnal man. But we're supposed to be spirit felt, have our own ministry and go out and search out the lost and the lonely, the poor and the sick. And if that's not what we're doing tonight... I think we need some help. Amen. You know, it's not just about us growing. It's about us going. And not just going there, but going out there. And, and we really need to work. And you need to start at home. The home is where things start. And as you two have your first child, which was awful quick, <laughs> Uh, you, will, you will know that it, it's hard to be a minister in your own home. But that's what you're called to be. Amen. You know, when we're raising our children, and I, I am the perfect example of how not to do something. I didn't raise my kids right. I was out of the church when my kids were growing up. And I led them the wrong way. You know, I will pay for that. For every, even though my sins are under the blood, even though the, the sorrow that I feel because I cannot get my kids to come into the fold is heavy. But there are consequences to my actions that I still have to account for. Even knowing that, I would not change anything because God put me here for a purpose and I have to endure the situation that I'm in and every person is different everybody's level of endurance is different every situation that we have to endure is different if we don't have that tonight we 
need if we don't have that love? If we're not suffering long, if we're not patient with the people around us, then we need to be here. And definitely tonight. Because here in a couple of minutes, we're going to go into communion. That's why I wanted to cut it short a little bit. And we all know what the communion is about. Communion is partaking of the Lord's body and His blood in a representation of His death on Calvary for us. A remembrance of the suffering and the pain that He went through to forgive us our sins. And Paul speaks very bluntly about the misuse of this sacrament. Amen. He says, people are taking this in vain, they're taking this unworthily, and they sleep. And they're not just talking about physical death, but spiritual death. And to be honest with you, out of the two, I'd rather have physical death. Because if we're suffering spiritual death, we're spending it in eternity of hell, fire, and brimstone. And I'm not even sure that the heat is going to be the worst part. I think it's going to be this absence of our Savior knowing that we could have done something about it when we were out here on the planet. Can you imagine going through eternity in a situation that's not so optimal, knowing that all you had to do is say, Yes, Lord. Amen. That's right. And you would, have, you, you would have saved yourself all of this. You know, there are far worse punishments than physical pain. You know, being in the military, the one thing I learned is psychological damage can be more effective to breaking a soldier, to breaking a prisoner, than physical. I can do more damage to your psyche than I can to your body. And that's what the devil's all about. Satan is not, it doesn't play fair. He's not here to play fair. He's here to break you. He's here to take you. He don't care. He don't love you. Anyone that says that Satan loves them, they got some serious issues because Satan has no love for any of us. All he wants to do is take us down and torment us. And one way he can do that is by showing us how to misuse yes. this sacrament. Because Paul says, for the reason of unworthiness, taking this thing unworthily, Many in our midst slumber. Many sleep. So the 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 <laughs> lost my word there for a minute. But this sacrament is so important to us because it is a representation of our Lord's body. He loved us enough. To come when we didn't want him to die for us on a cruel tree, and I, you know, I can't even begin to tell you how cruel that punishment is. And until you actually went through it, you don't know. You know, people say that the Passion of Christ was one of the best representations, but even that doesn't even touch it. But he loved us that much. That even when we didn't want it, he endured our sins and our struggles, our attitudes, our ego, just so that we could come to him and say, Lord, I accept you. We couldn't ask for anything more than that. Even though we didn't deserve it, he came to us.
ask the Lord, please, if there's any reason, if there is any reason and you can't get an answer from God tonight on it, clear pain. He said, ask and you shall receive. He said, if anybody calls upon the name of the Lord, he'll be saved. And the things that you can get, he'll do it. If you're coming from the heart, but it's got to come from the heart. Not from the mind, but from the heart. And I, I do believe that if you ask him from the heart, he'll show you the answer to anything, any problem in your life that you have today. And you become clear that you'll be able to partake of something that's valuable to, not only to you, but it's valuable to him because you're showing him that you're more concerned about your life, your soul, and other people, Lord, than you are your, your personal feelings in yourself. You can go ahead and say that. And the Lord, when he had gathered his disciples together, and they were sitting at the table for the last supper, he took the bread, and he broke it, and he passed it out. And he looked at it, and he held it before them, and he says, This is my body, which is broken for you. Take and do in remembrance of me. And as he held the wine, he blessed it. And he said, this is my blood, which I have shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Take up the blood. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you and we thank you for that body that was broken for that blood that was spilled, for that love that was shown through, uh, to us through all time, knowing that it was our sins that put you there, that you loved us so much that you would endure anything for us. Lord, I just ask that you bless this sacrament. Bless the people that are here. Lord, as we go our separate ways tonight, I ask that you put head protection around us. Bring us back again into your household if you should tarry, that we may feast upon your word again. Lord, I ask that this message sink in. Not only this message, but the message before it, where the pastor was talking about love, because they go hand in hand. You cannot have love without patience, and you cannot be patient without love. Lord, I ask that you show us a way. Lord, if any of us do not have a ministry tonight, I ask you to show us what our ministry is. That we may be a growing Christian, not that common man, not that natural man. Lord, I ask this in thy holy name. Amen. Amen.